Long time was the longtime senior pastor at Northside Baptist Church in uh, St. Albans, Vermont. And now my good friend Dan Frost is the senior pastor there. But um, we're looking forward to hearing about the Philippines and your work there. So let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you that we can come this morning and have this time. I pray that uh, we would be encouraged and challenged by uh, the study of your word and also by the, uh, uh, the work that's happening in the Philippines. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's a blessing to be here this morning. Uh, we were with our daughter for a late Christmas over in uh, Linfield, Mass. So we got to come across the Mohawk Trail today and uh, work our way over here. And what a beautiful view when you come out on top of the mountain and look down into the valley down here. It was very spectacular. Even coming from Vermont, where I'm used to some mountains, it was still beautiful. Uh, I've been around long enough and known uh, brother Eric long enough that when I looked up and I saw all the little blonde haired kids sitting up in the front that used to be his kids <laughs> you know I remember Ethan and Aaron and the crew when they were that so young so I'm going to read just a quick uh, word of God here we're going to do a three or four point message and it's going to be the shortest three or four point message you've ever heard and then we'll get into the pictures this morning but if you want to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 10 we're going to start off with a, a few verses from verse 13 down to 17. Romans 10, 13. <clears throat> For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a precious verse that is. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a promise of God. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I just love this, uh, this passage of scripture. If you're familiar with the Romans road, this is where we end up at the end of the Romans road. When we come along and we're, we're sharing the gospel with somebody. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 that for by grace are we saved through faith. That not of ourselves is the work. It's a gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. So if we're saved by grace through faith, where does that saving faith come from? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what we're going to look at this morning is not a testimony of what I'm doing. It's a testimony to the Word of God. The Word of God that is still saving souls and changing lives in Massachusetts, Vermont, and all around the world. It's a testimony to what the Word of God can do. First of all, we have the Word of Faith in Romans chapter 10, verse 8. But what saith it? The Word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. And uh, praise God, uh, you know, uh, Ethan's a whole generation younger than I am. And Paul was several generations older than I am. And yet we're all still preaching the same message. The word of faith has not changed. Not changed at all. It's still the same word of faith, the same message that Paul was preaching. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then the second point this morning, we see a promise of God in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's not my promise. That is a promise of God. That is a promise of God that if people will call upon him for salvation, he will save them. And then the third point this morning, I told you it's going to be a fast four-point message. I won't go quite that fast in the next service. But the third point this morning is a message from God. And what a great time to think of John 3.16 as we get through the Christmas season. Amen? Talk about a gift given. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And when we preach that message of God, we come down to the, the end of the Romans road in verse 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, 
Thou shalt be saved, for the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Before we were saved, my parents got saved before I did. They were in their 50s when they got saved. My, my sister got saved through a, a Bible study group at the college she went to, and then she brought Jesus home, and my parents got saved, and my younger sister and her husband got saved, and we were the black sheep. You know, we were on the outside. I was the chief persecutor of my mother. Don't talk to me about this Jesus stuff. We've got our own religion, you know, and I was her chief persecutor. But then we went to this Faith Baptist Church up in Winooski. And I didn't like the pastor, but they were having a singing evangelist in. Some of you may be around long enough to remember Norm Frank. And Norm was, Norm was preaching and singing with his family that day. And they sung a bunch of songs, and those songs were all gospel-based, and they touched my heart. And then he preached a simple message, 10-minute message, on John 3.16 and the Romans Road. And on the way to church that morning, I knew they were going to do an invitation because we'd been to that church a couple times. And I told my wife, I said, I don't care what they say. When they get to the end of the service, you stay in your seat. You stay in your seat. And then Norm finished up the message and he said, if you want to get saved, stand up. Now, we're, there's a hundred people there. And I knew some of them were peeking even though our heads were supposed to be bowed and our eyes closed. I just knew some were peeking. And Norm said, if you want to get saved today, stand up. So I stood up. And you know what I was thinking? My wife is going to think I am an absolute idiot. I told her to stay in her seat, and here I am standing up. And then he said, if, you want to, if you're standing, why don't you come forward? And he had led us in the little sinner's prayer. But he said, why don't you come forward? And uh, we'll have somebody talk to you and make sure you understand what's going on. So I opened my eyes to go forward. I was not peeking. I opened my eyes to go forward. My wife was standing beside me. So we got saved together, but separately. Neither one of us knew that the other one had stood up until he told us to open our eyes and come forward. So you know what I believe in? I believe in the power of God. In the power of God to save souls and change lives. You, you would not recognize me. When I was 28 years old, my doctor said, you're going to be dead by the time you're 50. He said, you, you've got a 60-year-old body. You're 28 years old. And I was a heavy drinker, and I was a heavy smoker, and I was a glutton. And he said, you are going to be dead before you're 50 years old. And now I'm 69 and still running half marathons. You know, so it, God gave me eternal life. God gave me a new life. And that's a message I want to share around the world. So can God take a drunkard and turn him into a preacher? I believe he can. Amen. I believe he can. I believe that verse that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then we come to Paul's questions down in verse 14. And he asks some good questions. He, How shall they call on him? in whom they not believed, and how shall they believe in him, in whom they've not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall they preach, except they be sent? And I'm here this morning to ask you to help me be sent. Uh, I, I, my church has always, well, in recent years, anyways, picked up my tickets. I wouldn't let them buy my tickets till after we paid the mortgage off. But in recent years, like recent 15 years, They've been paying for my tickets to go to the Philippines. Sharon and I pick up our other expenses. So I'm not here to ask for personal support. I'm a retired old man. The deposits go into the account at the, at, at, during the month uh, on a regular basis. So I'm not here to ask for personal support. I'm here to ask for money, as you have given before, to help purchase New Testaments for in the Philippines. And we're going to look at the power of those New Testaments in the Philippines. I'm hoping that I can go, go back uh, in October. October, November is when I normally make the Philippine run. I would have a second chance in January, because some of you know I've got a maple syrup business, so I've got to be back by the 1st of February, but I could have a second attempt in January. But I'm really praying that we can do our normal October, November 
timetable because that works really good for over there. Uh, there's another offering that my church will take up before I leave. It's usually two, three thousand dollars, and we'll see where that goes. I take that in cash and hand it out to the churches that I visit over there. And just a little bit of history before I get started, but in the 2000, summer 2000, we're building our church family. Three Filipinos showed up at our church. Uh, Rolando Pacong, you'll meet him in the slides. And uh, he showed up and he, he uh, uh, was persistent. I told him like 12 times he couldn't come and he called me the 13th time and I told him he could. And it was two pastors and a Bible college student they ended up staying with Sharon and I, and uh, I, I'm quite sure they got a, a trip down to uh, Massachusetts to be at North Adams Baptist Church during that time. Uh, and and we, they stayed with us. They helped us build the building. So I had a carpenter crew, you know, all week. They'd go out for church on Sunday. They'd be back on Monday morning. They'd be with us. And uh, we'd, we'd build church together. And uh, they, I didn't have a Macedonian vision or anything like that, but these, these three pastors kept on me. you got to come to the Philippines. you got to come to the Philippines. At that time, Sharon and I had not traveled anywhere other than Canada. And, you know, it was just a, 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 a we, we're not going to do that. But the Lord finally touched our hearts, and we went the first time, and... Uh, it's been, we've been over there about 14 times now. Some is for the Bible distribution. Some is to preach at the camps. Uh, so far, so far, we have handed out about 188,000 New Testaments since we started going in, the, in 2000. Uh, 188,000 New Testaments. Right now, I'm praying for, uh, uh, to raise money between twenty and 25000 so that we can go over there with another twenty four to 30,000 New Testaments to hand out again. And we'll hand those out in about nine days of preaching in the schools, because some of the schools are 2,000 high school students. We'll pull in, we'll spend an afternoon, and we'll, the largest group I ever preached to was about 4,200 in one group. 4,200 high school students, and the school board was all there, and the teachers were all there, and the staff was all there. It was a pretty amazing ministry. And then we handed out Bibles to these kids. So we, we can go through 30,000 New Testaments like that. Last time we had 24,000, and we went through them uh, really quickly. So we're going to go to the slides today, and uh, we'll get them up here. The first one is not that mountain. You're seeing the same thing? Oh, there we are. Okay, so I'm not going to see. Okay, I'm just going to sit down here because I've seen these. So I, I, I'll sit down here all the way. This is when we first arrived. When we first get there, it's about 46 to 48 hours from when we leave our driveway until we pull into Leyte. And uh, these kids are always there. One time the truck, the car broke down. We didn't get there until well after dark. All these kids were still there to sing the welcoming song and giving us a little flower to put around our neck. So we, I know we don't look great, but we've been traveling for about 46 to 48 hours by the time uh, this picture's taken. So we just jumped two weeks. I went from Leyte to Cebu, and now we're on this overnight ferry to go to Mindanao. Why would you take a picture of a toilet? Because after two weeks in the Philippines, a toilet with a seat on it looks truly amazing. We had our own separate little bunks. When we got there, 5.30 in the morning, we got off the boat. 7.30, we're headed up this hill to the first church. They have a Christian school there. We're preaching at the Christian school. Kids everywhere love snacks. When we show up, they, they turn out the snacks. Pastor Dandy Pondock, one of the young pastors we support at Northside, we help them buy the land, build this building. This is where that $3,000 offering goes that we take up just before I leave. Every church I go to, they put on a special service. They have a special meal. So depending where we are, we'll give them 50 bucks, 100 bucks, and we carry it in cash because it's really hard for them to uh, cash checks over there. Pastor Dandy started off. I took a picture of this dear little lady. She walks nine kilometers to get to church every day. That's about five miles. 
And by the time she gets there, she's got about 20 little kids walking with her. And basically, those little kids that she's been bringing to the church make up the Christian school. Everybody likes pictures. While I was preaching, this guy just sat there and glared at me the whole time. And uh, at the end of the service, he came up and he, he had tears streaming down his face. He touched his heart and he said, I have Jesus in my heart. So that was worth the trip right there. We're just getting started. Everybody loves pictures with Pastor Bruce and Sharon. Then we got into the, the schools. We take all these young pastors to carry the Bibles. And here we go. We just start off preaching in schools. John 3.16, Romans Road, give an invitation in your seat, sinner's prayer, and pass out New Testaments. And I never get old of that. Sometimes the weather doesn't cooperate very much, and we can get some rain. This is uh, Lito Galuta's church. He's just starting to build the church. Now they're all done. They've got, they're just doing the finishing touches. And every place we go, we went to the school in Lito's town, then we came back to his church. So there's that more of that offering. Jesse Galuta's church, his brother, another bathroom. We stayed in this, this little uh, lean-to on the side of the church. We had a nice little air mattress, their own bathroom at the end. It was awesome. More schools, more preaching, more Bibles. And then every now and then, I don't know what they do with the students, but they pull all the teachers together and they have me preach just to the teachers. And that is truly amazing. I've been a teacher. I was a teacher for 21 years before I became a pastor so I can really connect well with the teachers. And uh, once again, they love the pictures. Here's another feast at Brother Jesse's church. Everywhere we go, we have this uh, troop of young preachers that go with me, uh, rice fields, not like Vermont at all. There's nothing in the Philippines that's like Vermont, not even the grass. June Godero, I think he's been at this church before. His wife, Leela, they were preparing for a big dinner that night. Sharon made a friend with a cat with two different colored eyes. We were out in the schools preaching, absolute downpour all day. That night, we were having an evangelistic service. They put up a tarp. And with all the wind and the rain, it did not take the tarp down, which is absolutely amazing. Their church would probably seat about 30 people, Filipino style, which means they're just crammed in shoulder to shoulder. That's Pastor Jaira Cadero's wife, beautiful voice singing, got to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's an elderly gentleman, lower left-hand corner. He was in his 80s. He heard the gospel. He believed on Jesus Christ. Sunday morning, he walked into church, and he asked the pastor what he had to do to be baptized. He said, I know I need to be baptized. Didn't know what this was all about until somebody whispered in my ear that it was a baby dedication. You need to preach a short message. Okay, we can do that. Have to go prepared. Big meal like this, we might uh, give them $150. That little girl right there, if you look at that plate of food in her lap, she probably doesn't see like the food like that anytime unless she comes for a service to the church. And then the next morning, we're up at 6 o'clock in the morning. We're at another pastor's house having breakfast together with the army. Then off we go into the schools preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those stairs were kind of unique in the last picture. They, they were just carved into the mud, and you kind of walked up the mud and stairs. And then we get into the schools, and here's another group of teachers I got to preach to. And when we got to the sinner's prayer, just about every one of those teachers prayed the sinner's prayer. I was in one remote place that I was preaching the gospel, and uh, two of the teachers that were in that place said, we got saved when you were preaching at our school, and we were down in the city at one of the schools there before they moved. Pastor Jade Fabriga smoothing off that lot. So I preach during the day, and then at night, I will do a, uh, a, a evangelistic service in one of the churches. We packed them right out that night. They had all sorts of visitors. About 15 people got saved. And then once again, special dinner afterwards. Next morning, we got onto the road, and we're in this traffic. And Sharon and I both woke up. We had some sort of diarrhea bug, and we were both extremely sick. And we're thinking we got an hour and a half trip. We didn't know if we were going to make it or not. Got to this school where Pastor Roger Luna was setting us up. We got, went in to talk to the principal, and he said, I didn't know you were coming. And they did have an assembly that day. There was a Catholic priest and a lady that was all dressed in robes. I don't know what her role would be. But they went on for about an hour, 
and the principal had agreed to give me 15 minutes. So they dismissed the younger students, and we kept just the older kids. There's about 500 kids in there, and uh, we preached the gospel. Many of them prayed to receive Christ. You saw that one uh, student crying and rubbing their eyes because they were getting the Bible. My wife spent her whole day right here. She was just so sick, and I was so sick. Every school I went to, the first thing I found out, where is the bathroom? Now we're up in the hills. You notice something has changed here. Uh, we're in Muslim country now, and we're preaching the gospel in Muslim country. And I am gentle. I don't slam any religion. I just preach Jesus Christ. I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a 95% Catholic nation. Most of the rest are Muslim, especially when you get down in Mindanao. And I just preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the students and then to the teachers after we get done. Bobby Tago on the left met us and uh, took us out to lunch when we got back to the, to the island of the other side of the bay from where we were. Rolando Pakong's on the left. His wife, Ruth, is on the right beside Sharon. It's his fault. I go to the Philippines. When we got done uh, preaching that, we get that night, the next morning we got up before we went to the schools, I got to preach the Christian schools about 7 o'clock in the morning. We did the Christian school. We went out preaching in the schools all day long, a little break here. That little girl in the previous slide, she just loved holding my hand. I have no idea. Uh, she was one of the pastor's uh, daughters. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know the name of that pastor who was with us for those two, three days. But anytime I sat down, she would just come and hold my hand. A lot of construction in the schools under the new uh, president that they have over there. He's really putting a lot in the schools. And when we go room to room, I'm not the only preacher. We will have 8, 10, 12 uh, national pastors who will be also preaching. They love it. I tell them that the only reason they go with me is for the food, because every church we go to, there's a feast. This is after preaching in the schools all day. We came back, and we had a, they had a pastor's fellowship set up, so I got to preach to these pastors. I, got a, I put in a picture of this. Remember a while ago, they just had a typhoon hit the, hit the Philippines maybe three weeks, four weeks ago. And all around the Philippines, there's all sort of these, they're called squatters. Because all these buildings are built on, on uh, government property. And most of them used to have NEPA roofs. But after that big uh, typhoon that hit the Philippines back about 10 years ago now, there was so much scrap steel around that they gathered all the scrap steel. A lot of them have steel roofs now. But imagine those shacks when there's a typhoon coming in. There's not much left after a 150-hour uh, wind for a while. A lot of rice in that place. These are the gleaners. There's a big pile of straw that comes out of the machine that separates the rice from the straw. These gleaners and their families will go through that mountain straw and try to get just those few grains of rice that, that stuck with it. This is Pastor uh, Jun Jun and his wife, new baby. I got to preach at this. I was supposed to have Saturday off and then found out I was preaching at this Christian school. I preached on the two birthdays, that you have one birthday when you're born, another birthday when you're born again. And uh, the pastor told me afterwards, he said, all these kids understood was two words, birthday and Jesus. But they just loved having you preach to us. And then I turned it over to the national pastor, and he will basically preach the message in their tongue. They love fist bumps. The first one that comes up, it's all, always very shy. They don't know if they can approach me. And then I spent about half an hour doing fist bumps. This is Pastor Rolando's son trying to teach me how to use a computer. Good luck with that. Sunday morning in, uh, in Pastor Rolando Pakong's church, the Vermont pastors have basically built this church and the school and everything else that's on that property. Most of the money has come out of Vermont that's gone into this property. And he just put a big addition on. And uh, we had about 15, 16 people that were saved this day. And then after they do it, something interesting, after the main service is over, the kids will come up from their Sunday school children's church and they will recite their verse that they learned and sing a little song. This lady right here is Rolando's mom. She has made it very clear to me since I first went there, since Sharon and I first went there in 2000, that I am her American son. And when I'm in Ozami, she will take care of me. Uh, at Tangum City, she'll take care of me. I got lost there for a minute. When I was in the hospital in 2010, 
uh, from having an emergency appendectomy on Saturday night. Monday morning, I woke up, not sure I was dying. I finally fell back asleep. Uh, Monday afternoon at some point, I woke up, and this dear little lady, she's about four feet tall, was standing there, and you could see on her cheeks where the tears had dried from running down her cheeks, and she's standing there. No idea how she traveled to get to where I was, but she was standing there praying over me. And when I woke up, she took my hand, and she said, I love you, and I am praying for you. And by that night, I was pretty sure I was going to live again. I, I went septic after that surgery, so it was just a miracle that I'm still here today. Uh, two doctors in the Philippines, two doctors here say it's just a miracle that I'm here today. This is Pastor Orlando and his wife. The young lady on the left is married to the second guy from the right. The first time I preached in the Philippines, uh, Pastor Rolando had me preach at a church uh, school in Tangum City. I was up on this second floor balcony that looked out over the play field where there was 15, 1,600 kids plus the teachers. The young lady in the red dress was in elementary school then. She trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior, and now she is married to the pastor's uh, son, and they just made Pastor Rolando a granddad. These are the meals they put together for the, the, in some of the bigger churches for the visitors. They, will, they, were, they had over 100 of these meals set up. They handed all of them out and just the visitors that day. And uh, it just was an amazing, amazing time. Uh, the lady on the left in a white vest, blue jeans, we preached at a school that morning. And her sister, who was a teacher there, got saved and received a New Testament. She sent her New Testament or took her New Testament to this person who was her sister. Her husband had recently uh, deserted her. They can't get a divorce in the Philippines. Divorce is illegal. So they, he deserted her. She's been going through great trauma. And, and the sister said, this pastor is preaching at this church tonight. You need to go. She got saved. Babies, love to hold babies in my lap, but there is a danger with this. I don't carry extra clothes with me, and they do not do diapers. We had, uh, we had uh, another feast, so this is a place where we might give $150 because they put on a feast plus all those pre-box meals. A picture of Pastor uh, uh, Rolando Pacong's place from the outside and back in the schools again. School to school, room to room, teachers, groups of teachers handing out the Bible. What a blessing to see these two little girls reading their Bibles after they received their Bibles. And it's just everywhere we go, it's the same thing. That there's uh, two or three teachers and administrators up there in that line. The rest of them are all the young pastors that are traveling with me and preaching with me during this segment of our journey. So they all get to preach as well. They just love it. They get to preach and eat. On Monday night, we're leaving Tangoob City the next morning. And they always have a big feast for us. This picture right here represents the work of Pastor Rolando Bacong. He's got about, he's, he's about 50 years old, probably 50 something. And these pastors and their families that are here have been saved through his ministry, discipled through his ministry, and sent out to Platt churches. And I've got to preach in a lot of their ordination services as they get sent out. So we, have, we had a big feast that night. And uh, every one of these guys, I could tell you a story. Every one of them. These are all the young pastors that he's seen saved in his ministry, discipled in his ministry, and they're serving. There's a, maybe a couple from the outside that have come in and just joined with their fellowship. But just an amazing work that that young man is doing over there. So, uh, and I, I like it because we have put thousands of dollars into the Philippines. And uh, I like it because there's an accountability there. Because I'm there every couple of years to see where that money's spent. Make sure it's going to the right place. And then off we go. We're in a new area now. Been passed off to Jerry Maluyao sitting there uh, to the left of my wife. Uh, he is another one that just has a whole host of young pastors that they've seen saved and in, uh, in, uh, in their ministry and trained up in planting churches. Any of the white church you see, 
Those are the Bible college students. The others are the Christian school students. So we've already preached all day, and now we're doing this in the evening. And that's his son, Joshua, who will be the pastor there sometime. We got to hear special music from the Christian school, from the Bible students. Great invitation, uh, great response to the invitation. The, this was a brand new uh, college student dorm. This is their dorm. They, they get that bed. It's about 30 inches wide at max. There's two of them per cot. They have a, a little box at the end to put their stuff in. There's no air conditioning in this place, and they definitely don't need heat in that place. But that's where they will go for four years of Bible college. And I got to tell you, that's a great improvement from where they were staying before. One of the greatest blessings of this trip with Jerry Malloy's crew is I had about two hours in the evening after dinner just to sit down with the Bible college students, delivered a short message, and then just did a quick uh, uh, question and answer. We had a nice uh, breakfast in the morning with Jerry and his wife. I stay in their profit chamber when I'm there. And then we're off and running, back into the schools again, back into the schools again. And uh, just the, the new army of preachers as we're going with, new churches to stop by, new dinners to have. Young man, straight ahead, white t-shirt, uh, bending forward a little bit. After the message, I walked up and I, I tried to hand him a Bible. He didn't take it. And I said, son, don't you want a Bible? And he didn't move. And the guy behind him said, Pastor Bruce, he's blind. He can't see you. So I knelt down in front of him and, and I took his hand and I, and I asked him if he had trusted Jesus as his Savior. He said, yes. I said, do you want a Bible? He said, yes. Talk to him about what a blessing it's going to be when he goes home to be with Jesus. And the first thing he's going to see is Jesus Christ. And I just had a little word of prayer with him. This was a combined class. We're up in the mountains now. Probably the first American they'd ever seen in the flesh for most of these students. And when I looked up from, from talking to this young man, there's probably 30 people in the room and every one of them was crying. The tears were just rolling down their face. And what I didn't know was that his blind sister was in the same class. And I didn't know that until two hours later when we are already moved on. So I thought this was the last school I was preaching in. So I was having a good time signing Bibles. I had a great conversation with this young man, wheelchair bound. Uh, he wanted me to sign his Bibles. He saw, I usually don't sign Bibles because once I sign one, I have hundreds in line to get a Bible signed. So I usually don't sign Bibles. This was a small school up in the mountains. Once again, I thought I was done, so no rush. And he saw me signing Bibles, so he got word to Pastor Rolando to bring him over. And Rolando seemed to be in a hurry, and I didn't understand why he was in a hurry. I was having fun taking pictures. We had one more school, and I didn't even know it. We had this school to preach to. The national pastors had gone ahead with the Bibles, and uh, we were going to be late because I was fooling around signing pictures and uh, not knowing what my schedule was. I never know what my schedule is over there until I arrive on site. And these kids had waited for over an hour after school dismissed because they knew the American was coming and uh, the national pastors offered to uh, preach, distribute the Bibles, and the kids said, no, we want to see the American. Once again, they probably never seen the American in the flesh up in this place, because Americans aren't even supposed to be on the island of Mindanao. But they received the Bible. Another one of my favorite pictures, look at that little girl in the front. Is she excited about getting the Bible? And then once again, we stop at churches. We get a feast. We have another feast. This is Pastor Fernando de Ritt. Uh, this is uh, Wednesday night. We're at his place for a dinner. Uh, he arranged for me to preach at this school the next day. There was, there was like five, 600 kids there. Most of them profess faith in Christ, and they all received their New Testament. What a blessing to be able to hand out those New Testaments. Those New Testaments has got us into schools. In this whole area, the Polog, Baptist preachers were forbidden to be in any of the schools in this whole area. And then once uh, Pastor Durrett, he, he got me in. He said, this guy's not like those guys. They used to let them come in, but then some guys went in, and they just did some stuff that was deplorable, and, uh, and the, the whole superintendents in that area said, no more Baptists, they, no more can come. 
he got me in, and now we can, now 10 years later, since my first trip to the Polog, we can go into any school there is over there. More schools want us than where we can be. This is the pastor and his family from that area. I, why a picture of a bathroom, comfort room, as they call them? There's nothing comfortable around them. In there, there would be a little porcelain bowl to use for a toilet, a hole in the floor where the water goes out, and you take your bath and your shower and everything else is done in there. Uh, the, the shower is what you pour out of a dipper on top of your head. That morning, he found out that the night before, he found out that we we're coming. That morning at 5 o'clock, he headed to the hardware store to buy plywood to put on this CR because before it was just bamboo slats and you could see right through the thing and it wasn't suitable for the American pastor. So five o'clock in the morning, his wife went to the market to buy food to prepare a feast that she didn't know she was preparing and he went and bought the plywood, fixed it up. That's their church building. It looks like somebody had an automatic rifle uh, from inside the church with so many holes in the roof. Uh, that's their house made out of nipa and bamboo. Think about a, what a 150 mile an hour wind would do to that place. Passing out the Bibles again and just such an incredible blessing. That was the last class we went to. Thursday night where Pastor Fernando Duritz, over 100 visitors at his church that evening, preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. They had over 100 professions of faith that night. The members of the church and the visiting pastors are mostly sitting outside the church looking in through the doors and windows because the inside was filled up with visitors. And then we're at the airport on the last day that we are there. And uh, people kind of stare at us. Here is this uh, American standing in this group of pastors and, and wives and little kids, and we're all crying and we're all hugging each other. And some of these folks have traveled four hours to be there with us to say goodbye to us. And, uh, and this is how they, they all come together. And I've got to wrap up because I've got about one minute for the late time of 1020 to get done. But is the word of God still powerful? Is the word of God still saving souls and changing lives? I don't ask you to support me, but every time we get more New Testaments, we can get in more schools. And I'm nothing special. I, I, I'm like the white elephant. When we do those evangelistic services and pack out the services, if there was a national pastor preaching, people wouldn't come. But because there's an American, and you're in Mindanao, and Americans don't go to Mindanao, they will pack out that church. I mean, I feel like Billy Graham or somebody over there. You know, they just pack out the church and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But once again, it's not about me. It's about the power of the word of God to save souls and change lives. And I just pray if the Lord put it on your heart, this church has been faithful to help me purchase New Testaments for ever since I've been raising money for New Testaments. And I, I pray you just continue that. It's about a buck for a New Testament. For about a dollar, you can put a New Testament in the hand of a high school student. Those pastors have told me over and over again, those students take them home. They're written in their language, their national tongue. They take them home. They read them. They share them with their family members. One school uh, we went to, we preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there was such a change in the students in that school that the teachers talked to the principal, and the principal called the pastor, who's about 23 years old at that time, called the pastor, and he said, we want you to go to all the schools in our district and preach that same message, because we have seen such a change in our student body since that preacher was here and preached the gospel. Some of these guys that you see as pastors now, they were saved when they were high school students, sitting in a classroom where they heard the gospel, believed the gospel, trusted in Christ as their Savior, and received the New Testament. It's such an amazing ministry, and it has nothing to do with me. It's all about the power of God to save souls and change lives.
have a word of prayer and then uh, get ready for the morning worship service. So if you are interested in helping purchase Bibles, just designate it on an offering envelope. And if you're not prepared to do it today, just uh, write it on the envelope and uh, put it in the offering today and we'll trust you for it for next week. We already have a set amount of money that um, we put aside to give to Bibles and whatever else comes in, we'll add to that. So um, pray about it, think about that. But just think, um, a dollar a Bible. So 25 Bibles, 25 homes. And that multiply how many people live in a home. $50, 50 Bibles, multiply how many people live in a home. $100, think about that. And how many people live in a home. What an opportunity to share the Word of God. And, uh, just to see, uh, you know, kids, just think about it. Kids waiting an hour after school that you're a preacher. Uh, wouldn't really happen in the United States, would it? No. And the other reason kids stay an hour after school more times than not in the United States is because they got in trouble and they have to stay an hour. But uh, what a great opportunity uh, Brother Patterson has had. And uh, him and I have, oh, we've known each other for a long time. We work at camp together and, and uh, counseled, at, counseled at camp and got to Mexico together preached at his church, he's preached here, similar testimonies, that church where he got saved, Don Carruth was the pastor, and Shelly and I were about to get married, he preached at the Bratonville School on a Wednesday night, and Don Carruth gave his testimony of how God delivered him from alcohol. So it's um, amazing how God has weaved all of this together, and uh, so... Just to pray about it, think about it, and uh, you just saw from the pictures how God is working there in a great way. What a great opportunity. How many trips? Have, how many trips to uh, the Philippines? I've been there about 14 times. About nine of them, I think, was for Bible distribution. The others, they have me come over and preach youth camps. 14 times? Yeah, so I think I've been there 14 times total. Wow. wow. I didn't realize you were there 14. I know you were there a lot. I didn't realize it was 14. It's yeah. getting harder every time, brother, if I get any younger. <laughs> and it was in 2010 that you had emergency surgery. I uh, love it. 2011. In the Philippines, we had surgery. Uh, you have to pay cash for the surgery. So I had to raise money to have the surgery. You almost died. And uh, I remember that. Wow, it's 10 years, 11 yeah. years. Pastor Perkong was saving to build a house for his family. And he came up with the $1,600 to pay for my bill. Because they wouldn't accept credit card, the insurance wouldn't work over there, nothing would work in Mindanao. And uh, he paid paid the money so I could have the surgery. Of course, when I got home, the first check I wrote was to, to him. But uh, amazing. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for just the opportunity this morning to be here for the Sunday School Hour and to see the work that's going on there in the Philippines. and. Uh, the gospel being preached there in, in, in churches all throughout the nation and uh, Bibles that have been distributed, souls that have been saved, lives that have been changed, and homes that have been changed. And we pray for Brother Bruce as he gets ready to go again this year, that your blessings will be upon his trip, that uh, despite the pandemic he would be able to go. We pray, Lord, that to the monies that he's trying to raise um, will be raised and uh, we just look forward with great anticipation that uh, you'll just continue to use him in a great way to reach the Philippine people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bless our morning worship service to follow in Jesus' name. Amen.